points notices. Um, this meeting is being recorded um, and will be put on the Engineering Group YouTube channel um, along with all our other presentations um, to be used as a, as a, as a resource. Um, our next meeting will should have been um, the uh, 21st Glossop lecturer, um, David Charleston, um, at the end of November. But unfortunately, this has been postponed to uh, next year. So the 21st Glossop lecture will be given in 2021. Um, so um, our next meeting will be a social event in December um, and we'll announce the, the details on the date um, uh, shortly. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, uh, it's Dr. John Barlow, who is a senior lecturer in applied geomorphology at the University of Sussex um, and the director of Cen for the Center of Coastal Research. He's been conducting drone surveys of the cliffs near Peacehaven for four years and has created a significant inventory of failure events for this study area. Um, his presentation tonight is, well, you can see the title in front of you. So without further ado, I'll hand straight over to John. Thanks, Ursula. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good evening. Um, so today I'm just going to be talking to you about some research that my, my team and I have been conducting uh, at Telscom Cliffs. I'll show you where that is uh, in a few slides. Uh, using drone aircraft. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the background and, and the context of, of why we're doing this. Then I'll talk about the study area, uh, the methods that we've been using, and then show you the results and conclusions uh, that we've come up with so far uh, from this research. I've got about 44 slides uh, and we'll just fire on through them here. OK, so this is something from Future Coast, uh, looking at the uh, distribution of cliffs through England and Wales. So you can see, you know, the vast majority of, of the UK coast or the, the coastline of England and Wales is, uh, is formed of sea cliffs. And these can be broken up or classified based on their geology, uh, simple cliffs, compound cliffs, um, complex cliffs, that kind of thing. You can see here some of the statistics. 80% of the cliffs are formed in soft rock. So you would expect those to be, you know, significantly affected by wave erosion. 32% have an active landslip going on. 50% of them are sensitive to climate change projections. And only 6% have coastal protection or cliff stabilization measures in place. Uh, so there's, there's a pretty significant uh, issue with sea cliffs. And uh, you know, high precision monitoring is one method that we're using to, to look at these things. Mm. So as I said, you can you can you can classify cliffs, and this is something my colleague Roger Moore came up with um, into simple cliffs, where simple uniform geology—that's the kind of cliffs we'll be looking at today. Simple landslides occurring with cliffs. The upper right there—that's a famous Scarborough landslide from many years ago now. Composite cliffs with different geologies, and complex cliffs with uh, deep-seated failures and very complicated geologies. And just as a quick aside for the chalk cliffs, this is a picture um, taken by a friend of mine looking from the Coast Guard cottages out to Seven Sisters. I don't know if you remember this. This was in all of the newspapers of a very, very large failure uh, in chalk uh, happening. And you can see this happened at high tide and a huge uh, plume of water uh, sent up uh, by, the, by the failure mass, which is very interesting. So what else, what other issues do we have with, with coastal erosion? A lot of um, work has been done on this. And indeed, you know, the local councils through DEFRA have, uh, you know, a mandate to manage coastal erosion. And they usually look at historical records. So looking at, this, you know, mapped cliff positions um, and aerial photography and that kind of thing. Uh, the problem with this, of course, is that the error bars associated with historical maps and with with historical air photos are often very similar to the rate of cliff recession itself. So you're in this situation where you're not really sure whether you're mapping erosion or if you're just mapping error. Uh, and that makes, you know, using these data quite difficult. 
Of course, using historical data that are reliable to project future erosion is also pretty problematic, uh, given that we have you know projected sea level rise, projected increased storminess, and that kind of thing. Um, so it's a bit. It adds to the uncertainty of of you know future projections of, of cliff position, and you know perhaps adds a bit of uncertainty to planning around these things and you know putting in measures when they're when they're really necessary uh, in order to be as cost effective as possible. So we're looking at high precision monitoring and we're looking at a study area called Telskom Cliffs and this is a location just to the west of Peacehaven between Peacehaven and Salt Dean and the whole area is just a little bit to the east of Brighton Marina. And as you can see, this is one of the uh, few sections of cliff between Brighton and New Haven that's undefended. And what we have is about a 49 meter high cliff at its highest point. Um, the, the section between the seawalls at either end is about 712 meters long. And you can see on the eastern side, there is a big groin. And this is the outlet pipe from the Portobello Sewage Works. And that groin traps a little pocket beach, which trails out over about 350 meters on the eastern side of the site. So we have pretty much no defense on the western end of the cliffs, and we have natural defenses or beach defenses on the eastern side of the cliff. So this is a useful site in that you have a little bit of everything. Um, you can see in the very far um, western edge, we have a little bit of rock armor uh, protecting the seawall from being outflanked. The geology in this area is almost entirely New Haven chalk, though there is a tiny bit of Culver chalk uh, in the upper western section. And what have we been doing? Well, we've been trying to do high precision monitoring of these cliffs, and we've been doing so for, for a few years now. Um, the method that we pioneered here was using a UAV photogrammetry to do this. Uh, typically, high precision monitoring has been undertaken using something called terrestrial laser scanning. Um, this produces very nice quality data, but it is the instruments are very expensive and it's quite time consuming setting up the total stage or uh, the uh, terrestrial laser scanning on the platform and moving along the sea cliff. Uh, I was involved at Durham University with a project that did similar work using terrestrial laser scanning and uh, it is quite labor intensive. So a way to reduce the labor cost, but getting um, data of similar quality much more easily uh, seemed to me using drone aircraft to do this. And so that's what we've been doing. And the first step in doing that, as we see here, is setting up a ground control network. So you can see here, we, use, we set up a total station on the shore platform and surveyed in a bunch of points, a bunch of points along the base of cliff. And then we used GPS to survey in a bunch of points along the top of the cliff. And the reason why we had to use total station, of course, is because the uh, the shielding of the cliff, topographic shielding of the cliff obscures the sky view. So you can't really use uh, GPS receivers at the bases of cliff without reducing the accuracy. But anyway, using this, these methods, we, we built up a fairly nice network of ground control points, which we could then use to um, georeference our data. We do this by putting these little targets up. You can see a section of cliff here. Um, with the various targets put in, those along the bottom and those along the top. We know the coordinates of these targets to the centimeter scale precision. And of course, we can then, the software automatically recognizes these targets and, and georeferences our data. So that gives us a georeferencing and it also gives us an indication of uh, how close their data are, the accuracy of our data, if you like. And we're using this drone aircraft. So this is a DJI S1000 octocopter. We're using a heavy lift drone for this research because um, we're doing photogrammetry. And when it comes to digital photogrammetry, uh, the bigger the sensor, the more accurate your results are going to be. So we needed a drone that could lift a, a pretty heavy camera. And what we've got here is a Nikon uh, D810 camera. It's a 36 megapixel camera. It's a full frame camera. So it has a pretty large sensor head um, and we had some very nice images with this. Uh, the next upgrade we're thinking of doing for this research is using a medium format camera. So an even bigger uh, sensor surface uh, that should improve our accuracy a little bit as well. 
and those are now coming down in weight and size, so we should be able to fix something like that to the drone in the not too distant future. So we're doing digital photogrammetry. So we're taking pictures as we're flying along, and you can see here a picture is just an array of pixels uh, reflected off the surface of the cliffs into the camera. We have the same point on the cliff face being photographed from multiple different locations. So if we know the optical properties of the camera, uh, we can then determine a range between the camera and the point on the cliff based on multiple observations. And that's the basis of creating our surface models. So we've got the drone flying along the base of cliff, well, mid cliff height, at about three meters per second. It's taking a picture every five seconds. And so we have about 15 meters between uh, image stations. And the, the camera is about 50 meters from the from the cliff face as we're doing this. And so we're getting, you know, at least three, perhaps four or even five observations of each section of cliff uh, from the data. So just to show you, here we have two images of the same section of cliff taken from slightly different angles. And when we combine those using the photogrammetric principles, we get a 3D model of the cliff face. So this is the 3D model with the image actually draped over uh, the surface. So you can see the, the very high level of detail uh, that we're getting with these data. So here's just a map showing the flight plan. So we fly from the shore platform. Obviously, this image was taken at high tide. We wouldn't be out there at high tide. But we, uh, we fly from the shore platform, and that's because we want to avoid the rotor effect of the wind blowing up over the cliff top. Uh, you wouldn't want to fly a drone through that because it would like to uh, tip the drone over and you'd lose your equipment. So we fly from the shore platform. We follow waypoints, GPS waypoints. So each survey is flying exactly the same waypoints using exactly the same settings on the drone. So we're getting very high repeatability in our data. And the drone flies through this program automatically comes back to you and you basically just have to take off and land the aircraft uh, manually. And once again, it's flying at about three meters per second while it's on its survey transects and it's taking a picture every five seconds. Uh, so that's giving us about 55 images in each survey set. Uh, each image is about 100 meg. So you're looking at about five gig uh, of data for each uh, survey. So if you're gonna do this kind of work, you have to keep in mind that uh, there's a lot of data and data storage does become an issue uh, at some point. So here's a video, hopefully, of the drone flying along its transect. You can see it coming into view. We've got the camera pointed at the cliff and it's um, being maintained orthogonal to the cliff face through live streaming video. So there's an operator controlling the, uh, the orientation of the camera here and making sure that it's always pointed directly at the cliff face. OK, so we get these pictures and you can see here this slide is showing uh, some of the views from within the software environment that we use to process the data. And we use uh, Adam 3DM mind mapping analyst to do this, which is a fairly expensive uh, piece of software, but it is extremely effective. So you can see here the different camera stations uh, and you can see part of the point cloud of the cliff from looking from above and looking in the sideways and then looking from an oblique angle. So we have the point cloud data that we use to generate um, a very high resolution surface model of the cliffs. And then we have the photographs themselves, so the multispectral data. So we can overlay that over our, over our models as well. So you can see the ortho photo of the entire cliff face above. And then the section below is the ortho photo of the cliff face draped over uh, the 3D imagery. 
And once again, you can see the very, very high level of detail. So typically, once we're, we're done with this process, we, we have a very nice model of the cliffs. Point density on this data is about 354 points per meter squared. And the accuracy of the data, the 3D standard error for our control network is about three centimeters. So here you're looking at data that's very, very similar to terrestrial laser scanning in its quality and, and characteristics. Uh, each flight takes about eight minutes. So it's very, very cost effective and time effective, uh, much more so perhaps than stations on the floor on the shore platform. Okay, so we've been flying this cliff and getting data sets of this kind for a number of years now, and we've been using these data to look at uh, some of the characteristics of these cliffs. And the first thing we did was look at the kinematics. And so you know, for those who don't know, kinematic analysis involves looking at the discontinuity surfaces within a rock mass, um, comparing those to the, the strike of a cliff face or of a slope, and then seeing what, what modes of failure are possible. And the simple one here, of course, is just planar failure or slab failure. We can also see wedge failure, toppling, and that kind of thing based on a kinematic analysis of the data. So what we did was we used the imagery draped over our models to map out all of the discontinuities, surfaces that we could identify on the cliff face. And here is a few examples uh, showing that mapping. So we had different joint sets, bedding planes, faults, that kind of thing. And so this was a pretty significant undertaking, uh, but uh, and pretty time consuming because it was done manually. But uh, we, we mapped out pretty much everything we could see. And then we produced a stereo plot of, of these data. So you can see we've identified two principal joint sets. Uh, in the, both pretty steeply inclined and both you know, coming out of the cliff face. And we also mopped a lot of bedding planes. The bedding planes are pretty much horizontal. So we looked at these two joint sets and we thought, okay, let's do an analysis, a statistical analysis of our mapping to see what kind of failure events are possible at the site. And the first thing we noticed when we did this was that wedge failures are by far the most common um, possibility at the site. And you can see here, this is a stereo plot showing all of the possible combinations of the joint surfaces that we mapped out. And about 40% of them meet the criteria for wedge failure. So wedge failure, by far the most important. And here's an example in the upper right, just showing an old wedge failure scar. And you can see the two jointing surfaces mapped in there. We also looked at planar sliding and we found about 8% of our mapped surfaces uh, suggested planar sliding was possibility. And you do see that at the site. There are a few smaller ones like this one. And direct toppling. We looked at direct toppling and we found about 7.5% of our mapped out discontinuities allowed for direct toppling. So a little bit rarer, but it does happen at the site. And whilst we've been watching this site, as you might expect, we've seen a number of wedge failures. So this is the an early one that we saw. It involved about um, 100 cubic meters of material and you can see here the kinematic analysis on the right this is indicating failure on a single shear surface so although it's a wedge block it's only sliding on one failure surface you can see before and after before is photograph a in the upper left after is photograph b in the center and then photograph c you can see is the volumetric change detection so at its deepest point, that little wedge failure has gone back about two and a half meters. And here's an oblique photograph taken from the ground of that wedge failure. You can see the two failure surfaces there and the direction of sliding. And we've got a bunch of these. We've done some modeling on them just to, to confirm our kinematic analysis. Uh, and, you know, it's 
a very, very interesting um, little project looking at all these little wedge failures. That was a small one. We've also had very large ones. And what I'm going to show you next is basically a time series of the erosion that we're seeing uh, and what happens after you have enough erosion. So here you can see this is in 2016, the first year of monitoring. Um, this is the month of August to September. And you can see the green areas there, a little bit of wave erosion at the base of cliff. As we move forward, September, not much happening. That change there is more associated with beach erosion. There's a little beach at the back there. Then we, in October, November, we had a little bit more, fairly significant failure. November, December, we had a little bit more in the same area. A little bit more in December, January. Not too much in January, February. And then in February to March, we had this absolutely huge uh, wedge failure, which also pulled down um, a significant portion of the rock once it had failed uh, on the right hand side of the wedge. Uh, you can probably see based on the colors here, there's a there's a line that's pretty obvious uh, showing the wedge. And then on the right hand side, uh, there's a fairly, so not, some of it's pretty deep, but that, that bit was pulled down with the wedge. And this is about 2,500 uh, cubic meters and involves about the, the entire height of the cliff right at the center, so about 45 meters high. And the furthest back it went is about six and a half meters here. So a fairly significant erosion event. And there's an oblique area picture of the failure on the left. You can see quite clearly the wedge surfaces and it's pulled down the uh, a fairly large chunk uh, to the right of those as it's come down. And here's a picture showing cumulative erosion for the year of 2016 to 2017. And you can see we had that big wedge failure. We had the little wedge failure to the right and a bunch of other failures that happened after that little wedge failure uh, to the right as well. And you can see wave erosion along the base of cliff. Note that it's all in that area that doesn't have a beach or a seawall. Um, those areas that are protected by the beach, we're seeing virtually nothing happening. So what else can we do? Well, we're interested in looking at uh, making future predictions, and we decided to try a statistical approach using the negative power law scaling of uh, our rockfall inventories. So we have thousands and thousands of failures in our rockfall inventories. Uh, pretty much anything larger than the size of your fist or about a thousandth of a cubic meter is being detected by, by this process. And so we have, when we, we make a histogram of, of those data, magnitude on the x-axis and frequency density normalized by time on the y-axis, uh, and plot those on logarithmic axes, we get these very, night, very nice um, power laws that we can best fit to those data. And you can see they, they, they follow power law scaling over um, nine or 10 orders of magnitude here. So, so um, very nice fit to the negative power law scaling. And when we look at negative power law scaling, we're getting equations for these power laws of F equals S times N to the negative beta. So F here is frequency density, M is magnitude, and the S and beta values are the empirical coefficients. Uh, that uh, we could perhaps use to, to model erosion going through time. So here S is the indication of overall activity and the S values at the site range from 0.1358 to 0.4439 over that time period. And the beta values indicate the slope of the line in log space, if you like. And that's varied between 1.421 to 1.645. So we were interested in looking to see if we could find any kind of environmental control that perhaps correlated well to those um, coefficients S and beta. And indeed, if we look through all of the environmental conditions as, as over the period, we found significant correlations between um, significant wave height at the site and both the S and beta values. And so if we use those correlations 
to uh, predict total frequency, use that to predict erosion, uh, we can simulate um, recession. And you can see here a couple of simulations. Uh, the black line is simulating a lot of erosion. The lower line is simulating less erosion. And this is based purely on a Monte Carlo simulation of, of um, those S and beta values uh, compared to the probability of significant wave heights at the site. Um, and we can do this by incorporating climate change. So we can incorporate um, increased storminess, so projected increases in significant wave height. And we can also include sea level rise in terms of the, the time that wave, is, wave action is, is happening on the base of the cliff. And so the black line here represents a future projection that incorporates those climate change projections. And the gray line indicates a simulation that uh, does not, that just follows initial conditions. So that's one simulation. Um, one simulation of itself is perhaps not very useful. But if we do 10,000 simulations uh, using a Monte Carlo approach, uh, we get a distribution of possible outcomes based on all of the probabilities uh, involved. And you can see here on the left, that's the raw data. And you can see it's pretty skewed, with a pretty long right-hand tail. If we logarithmically transform that data, we get a more normally distributed uh, distribution that we can apply parametric statistics to. And so we can talk about potential failures in terms of current conditions, in which case the model predicted between five meters of erosion and 121 meters of erosion, and future conditions, where it's also about five meters, but out to 143 meters of total erosion. And we can apply the probabilities of normal distributions on those log transformed data. And that's pretty useful because just having uh, a mean erosion rate projected forward is better than nothing. But knowing what the error bars are allow you to be a little bit uh, more prepared in your planning. So for example, here, this is a result uh, of, of that modeling exercise. And you can see the blue line is the prediction, the mean prediction for current conditions. The uh, yellowy orange line there is the line that incorporates climate change projections. And this is from the current cliff position. But you can see we have that distribution. So it's possible that the line could be significantly more landward. And so the dashed uh, blue line represents the mean plus two standard deviations. So there's about a 5% chance that it could be as far back as this, according to, to our approach. And the dashed orange line is the same, two standard deviations incorporating future climate change. So this shows that there is a possibility that, and this is going up to the year 2089, this projection, that uh, the A259 will be breached uh, by coastal erosion in that time period. And we can put a, you know, a, a percentage chance on that. Uh, and that's pretty useful. So here's a, just a graph showing probability of breach. And the dark line here is the, the projections that incorporate increased storminess and sea level rise. And the gray line is under future conditions. So this is the chance. And you can see under current conditions, the probability is just below 8%. Um, with future climate change incorporated, that's coming up to almost 11%, so about a 3% uh, increase in, in the probability of breaching the A259 uh, up to 2089. And if you want to massively extrapolate, you can see that um, the 100% certainty of breaching that road for the current conditions falls about 21 70, no, 7190 uh, for the one that incorporates climate change, it's about 2160. So a few, a few decades there. And of course, extrapolating in this way is, is to be taken with a grain of salt. So that's what we've been doing. 
Uh, all of this research has been published. You can check it out. This is the marine control paper used to um, model future conditions. The kinematic analysis data has also been published in the International Journal of Remote Sensing. So you can check those out. If you'd like them, just send me an email and I'm happy to, uh, to forward you the PDFs for these. So what have we come, out for, come away with in this, uh, in this research? Well, we, we've, I think, proved that the drone aircraft is a very effective way of doing high precision monitoring of cliffs. It's safe, it's low cost compared to other technologies. We're getting long sections of cliff uh, and very, very efficiently. Uh, we don't really have to go near the cliff very much to get these data. We're generating dense point clouds that can uh, be used uh, in a similar way that terrestrial laser scanning data is used. We can extract rock discontinuities for kinematic analysis using a combination of the 3D point cloud and the um, multispectral data. We found that for our site, wedge fair by far the most common, and we've seen quite a few of them now uh, at the site to confirm that. And our modeling exercise indicates there's probably an 11% chance that the A259 will be breached by 2089. Questions? John, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I think possibly the most orderly way to do questions is if people um, electronically raise their hand um, and then I'll um, come to them. You might have to unmute yourself because um, I don't know if I can. Ah. Evening, Ivan. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, Herschler. Yes. Um, a very interesting um, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I just wonder if you'd like to say a bit more, John, about the way you extracted the data for each individual discontinuity, the, the dips and strikes from the, uh, from the drone uh, results. So what we did was we used the 3D data so the point cloud data and we draped the the ortho photos over them and then we followed the the standard um i can't remember the the regulation off the top of my head but we were looking for fresh uh discontinuity surfaces um, and we can map out their their area on the data and that would define a plane and then based on the plane we would get the uh the dip and strike of of the various uh discontinuity surfaces that we're mapping. All right, so, so the, the dip and strike actually measured off the data, the data yeah, produced. The measured off off so you're basically defining an area and that's going to yeah. create a plane and then you're yeah. getting, so we're not looking at a parent dip or anything like that, we're looking at, you know, the actual uh, surface derivatives derived from the plane. Right, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan. Um, I think Simon Price was next. If you'd like to unmute yourself, Simon. Yeah, thanks, Ursula. Is that okay? Yeah, that's um, great. Thank you for the talk, John. Um, it's actually a direct follow-up to Ivan's question. I was wondering if you'd had um, any opportunities to look at automating ways of capturing that discontinuity data. I, I see the definite advantages of the acquisition by photogrammetry, which is really rapid. And then there's the manual part. And just there. wondering if, if you've done any experimenting. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, actually, we have. Um, there's there's a piece of software called Cloud Compare, which is which is freeware, and it, it is capable of of defining these kinds of thing automatically. Um, in our experience, you can you can get something similar to what we modeled, but um, there's a lot of false positives we were finding, so we stuck with the manual mapping uh, for this one. Does that answer your question, Simon? Simon, you've you've muted yourself. Yeah, I mute myself. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was just interested. It's something that that uh, colleagues um, have been experimenting with as well. So I was just interested in, yeah. in your yeah. experiences. There are various software environments. Uh, the one that's probably the most accessible is, is, as I said, that cloud compare software environment, um, and 
yeah, we haven't tried it for, for perhaps a year or so, but uh, we were getting a lot of first pulse positives, as I mentioned. Okay, all right, that's interesting. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Simon. Um, I think uh, Tazos is up next. If you'd like to unmute yourself. Many thanks, John. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, in this area, large-scale failures are happening uh, due to tensile fractures behind the cliff face. So, so kind of there's, there's, there, there is usually a tensile crack that forms behind the big wedges, wedge blocks. Yes. Can we can we use this uh, the drone data to to measure the opening of this, you know, to to, to find the critical opening that will We've, mobilize we, the big you failures? Can, you 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 can see these big tensile failures in some places like Seven Sisters. Um, we've walked the top of these cliffs, and obviously the drone is looking face on, so the the cliff, the tensile cracks are more visible from above. Um, but you don't really see them. I don't know if it's because they're forming very rapidly, um, or because the soil isn't isn't uh, allowing us to see them. Uh, but they they do form. We're actually looking at um, putting in a micro seismic network on these cliffs, and uh, trying to. Uh, you know, record the acoustic emissions of these cracks as they as they form, and then mapping those out. Uh, we have big plans, but uh, uh, we 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 can't really see the crack forming. Um, there's a potential to see um, strain accumulations at the base of these big failure blocks. Um, the precision of our data isn't quite there yet, but perhaps the medium format camera we we might be able to get. Uh, uh, strain accumulation as a predictor of failure, um, and there, there's a plan to use uh, a radar drone as well to see if we can measure that. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Um, is, is that your question answered now, Tessos? Uh, you, you've muted yourself again. Thank you, John. Yes. Uh, um, have we got any more questions from anybody? Is that another one from Simon? Oh, yes. It is. It um, is. Am, am, am I allowed? Uh, let allowed. me go to David Ingram first because uh, no, no he's problem. raised his hand. Um, uh, David, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Um, thanks, John. Um, just just going back. Back to that uh, cloud compare question that, that Simon raised. I was just wondering if you guys uh, did any comparison in, in terms of the results that you were achieving uh, that, that were uh, coming through in terms of manual interpretation of those discontinuities versus the automated. Were you seeing much of a much of a difference? In yeah, the final results? I, had a, I, I had a graduate student do this. Um, I can't recall the 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 numbers off the top of my head, but uh, he was getting a lot of force pulse positives, as I said. So, okay. yeah, probably because the cloud compare algorithms are based solely on uh, morphology. So any smooth surface, um, and it might not necessarily be a failure plane or, or a discontinuity surface. It could just be the, a, a smooth portion of the cliff face. Uh, so that's that's the, the main issue. Um, perhaps there's a, there's you know an automated way of doing this involving um, image remote sensing and uh, image segmentation and that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, I haven't really looked into that. Right. Are you are you aware of any uh, software that's really available in terms of doing the manual other than the Adam Dex software, um, which I know is fairly pricey? Uh, I don't because I've I've just been using the Adam. Yeah. Right. I'm not. No I'm not sure. Right. I'm not sure if the uh, structure from motion software can do it. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next, we'll go back to Simon Price. I think you had another question. Yeah. Thanks, Ursula. Uh, John, it was just um, just a question about next steps. I guess if if you how are you planning, if at all, to incorporate this into sort of bigger scale? geohazard assessments of coastal recession for, for planning purposes? I mean, the, the, the way to employ this kind of work over larger scales is to start using fixed wing aircraft. Um, we're, you're using the multi-rotor 
so we can fly from the short platform and it's a very low cost cost thing um, with a battery we can get about a kilometer maximum of, of sea cliff which is much better than what we had before um, but if you wanted to get very very long sections of close of coast perhaps a, a fixed winged aircraft uh, with uh, perhaps a better camera uh, you could do do a lot um, for the site in question we're as I said we, we, we have some plans we've, we've we're putting in a proposal next week actually to to the NERC to uh, to look at trying to use satellite remote sensing to look at the short platform down wearing and to look at using a, a radar drone to try to measure strain accumulations to predict where these failures are having uh, putting in a micro seismic network to try to map out where you know the rock bridges are cracking uh, in in three dimensions and trying to, uh, to to model these things deterministically and uh, hopefully that will give us a, a tool that will actually give us a predictive time to failure for these big failure blocks and that would be a world for us so for coasts which would be fantastic no that's good thank you i, I guess just a really really quick follow-up is uh, have you thought about then incorporating that into risk assessment so looking at looking at potential impacts on receptors whether that's infrastructure or pipelines or anything else that is that is around the coast yeah i mean there's some critical infrastructure at this site as i mentioned the portobello sewage works and the road um so yeah i mean we we have done the the recession modeling um it's certainly something we could do at other sites um i haven't done it yet okay thank you excellent thank you very much simon um, I think next um, in the queue was Yanis. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, John, for the presentation. Very, very interesting stuff. Uh, the Thank thing you. that I wanted to, the thing that I would like to ask you is in your assessment, in terms of persistence, how have you dealt with it? If you have taken it into account when assessing the cliffs and what is the potential impact from that? Right. Um, this is something that we are currently starting to look at because we now have um, multi years of data. We, we actually can can produce what I'm calling 4D ground models and uh, potentially look at joint persistence um, and try to put a number on those things. Um, so we, we haven't considered it yet. Um, but we're going to start looking at that. I, I have a PhD student who, who's currently looking at that in conjunction with uh, doing some material testing, rapid material testing involving the Equitip uh, hardness tester. Uh, so that that should that those results should be coming out hopefully in a couple of years. Awesome. Thank you. Excellent. Many thanks, Yanis. Um, next up is uh, David Churston. Um, if you'd like to unmute your mic, please. Uh, thanks, John, for a really interesting lecture. Your lecture was really in two parts. There's the wonderful graphics and the, the sexy drone and everything like that. And then, then you get into very complicated maths. And what I'm wondering is how, if you were to give this, you, you talk to the general public about your work here, uh, say community engagement would be a buzzword or public understanding of science. How, how do you explain to them your statistics? So your negative log work is beyond 99% of the population. Uh, that's a very good point. I did actually give a similar lecture to the Telscom Residents Association. Ah, oh, that's exactly my question. To, to, to a sold out house. Luckily, they weren't paying. And, and yes, I did have that experience. Um, they, they, it's, it's hard for a lot of people to follow. The truth is the maths, you can do that analysis in Excel. I, I could show you how to do it in, you know, a day. Um, but uh, trying to explain the maths and we're, we're, we're integrating under curves and, and doing things like that. Um, I, I kind of gloss over it after having had that experience. Um, but I can cert uh, certainly in the paper, um, if, if you'd like, the, the, that, that math is, is discussed in detail. No, my question is actually, sorry to continue, but it's, it's the other way around. If you think about what the University of Plymouth has been doing about the public understanding of science and people don't even understand vertical and horizontal very well. So how do you explain to the, the, the owner of a bungalow nearby 
what your 10% chance of the road failing in the next three, four, five decades is? What's, what's yeah. the method of explanation you in, can in use? In my experience, it's to not, it's, it's going to be a black box approach with people who, who don't understand the math. That you just have to tell them what, what the chances are and explain what those chances mean in practice. So, you know, the, the probabilities around normally distributed data. Um, and and that's pretty much all you can do in my experience with with, with people who who have no scientific training. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, David. A, a fascinating question that um, um, many people have to to deal with is uh, dealing with the public. They they can really throw you some curveball questions. Oh, indeed they can, and uh, and they they have a very good knowledge of history as well for their area in most cases. And, uh, you know, they, they know things that perhaps you don't know and should know. Well, if I could come in to, again <laughs> to pursue the conversation, this is exactly the sort of problem that there are radioactive waste disposal RWM company is facing now. How, how does it explain geology a kilometre down to the general public? It's, it's a very, very tricky problem. Yeah, I mean, scientific communication it is is certainly challenging with with people who who have no numeracy thanks <laughs> great thank you um is there any more questions um I've, I've still got two hands up but i presume that um ivan and Tazel, your your hands are still left up from your previous questions rather than you having more questions um does anybody else have thank you both Anybody else have any more questions? No. Um, okay. Cool. Well, excellent. Um, well, I'm, I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking John for giving us an absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. And um, I know that um, uh, we'll try and, and get your um, uh, PhD student to talk about um, equitip hardness testing um, in the future. Indeed, we should. Um, Yes, indeed. Um, so then you can reverse the uh, reverse the torture of sitting, sitting there <laughs> watching him rather than the other way around. Indeed. Excellent. Many thanks, John. And um, Thank I'll uh, for, call uh, the meeting. Coming to... to listen to me. Sorry. Thanks to everyone who came to listen. Uh, I'm pleased so many showed up. Uh, yeah, we had um, 30, 38 people. Excellent. Which is really good. Okay, I'll call the meeting to a halt there. Um, when I can find a, a teenager to get the, the recording off uh, Teams, I'll put that up onto the onto the Eggs YouTube channel. Um, so we'll call it a day there. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you on the Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.